So our uh, goals today is to talk about the non-motor symptoms, what we call the invisible symptoms. And so everybody, including doctors, when they go to medical school, what they learn about Parkinson's disease is they learn about tremor, learn about changes in posture, slowness, all of these motor symptoms. And even to physicians, a lot of these other symptoms are invisible. And so it's really important that patients and their caregivers are aware of it and that you can bring them up to your physicians if they don't ask about it. Uh, these symptoms are really important. And so there's been a number of studies that show that these symptoms are some of the biggest contributors to people's quality of life. Uh, they're big contributors to disability. Um, a lot of these things interfere with other things that we talked about. So exercise is very important when people are depressed, when people are not sleeping well. Uh, they can have a lot of barriers to exercise. Um, so these uh, symptoms really impact almost every aspect of people with Parkinson's disease lives. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why they happen, because I think when people understand why they happen, uh, that it empowers them to do more about it. Uh, particularly with things like depression, where there can be shame and stigma around it, to really understand that depression is part of Parkinson's disease just as much as tremor is part of Parkinson's disease. And it merits treatment just as much as tremor merits treatment. And the last thing which is important is that almost everything that I talk about today is treatable. And if it's not treatable, it's at least manageable, that there are things that can be done about it. And I think that's probably the most important things that you can get out of it, if you forget everything else, is what we can do, or that there are things that can be done about these types of symptoms. Um, so some of the important things to know is that, like this talk says, that these symptoms are invisible. Um, so people can't see fatigue, uh, they can't see depression oftentimes, um, they're not able to sleep, see your sleep problems, but nonetheless these things really impact you and they can be invisible to the people around you. Um, and as I said, they have also can be and are oftentimes invisible to your physicians. Uh, one of the main reasons that people with Parkinson's don't have depression treated is that their physician does not recognize their depression and that the patient doesn't bring it up. Uh, they're part of Parkinson's, they affect quality of life, they have treatments. One of the things which I think is an important caveat is that when I go through these, and there's hundreds of non-motor symptoms, uh, a lot of times when I'm doing a study with this, people will say, well, I haven't gotten that one yet, uh, or I haven't gotten that yet. Um, but not everybody with Parkinson's is going to have every symptom. In fact, I think most people with Parkinson's are not going to have every symptom. But it, nonetheless, it's important to talk about because there's probably several people in this room who have some of these symptoms. Um, and could use help for them. Um, so the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, which people are familiar with, there's tremor, um, there's slowness, what we call bradykinesia, stiffness or rigidity, and imbalance. And those are really the four cardinal symptoms, and that's what most of our time is spent on. Um, these are the non-motor symptoms, and so you can see there's at least five times as many non-motor symptoms as there are motor symptoms. And I think that in and of itself is a clue that these things may be important. And for the rest of the 25 minutes that I have, I'm going to go through these in kind of more detail in different groups. Um, so this first slide, I really like this, uh, like this cartoon. It says, I have a photographic memory. It takes at least an hour for it to develop. <laughs> and, and I like this slide for a couple reasons. One, I think it really highlights the difference between uh, memory problems that people with Parkinson's disease have and memory problems that people with Alzheimer's disease have. Um, so one of the things that we do in clinic is that I'll give people three words, say brown, tulip, and honesty, that I want them to remember. And then five minutes later, when I ask them again, they may not be able to remember them. In people with Parkinson's disease, if I give them a clue, I say one of the words was a color, and then they say, oh, yeah, 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 it was brown. That tells me it's a problem of pulling things out or retrieval, not a matter of getting it in. Whereas somebody with Alzheimer's disease, the clue doesn't help because it didn't get in there. Um, and so people with Parkinson's disease, even when they do have memory problems, there's still a lot more that we can do about it. It's actually a more treatable condition that, than the memory problems that we see in Alzheimer's. Um, people with Parkinson's kind of fit into three categories. So a lot of people with Parkinson's have normal thinking and memory. And everybody after age 25 has changes in their thinking as memory. Um, and so that's pretty normal uh, that there are going to be changes as people get older. Mild cognitive impairment means that people have more problems with their thinking and memory than we would expect for their age. And in people with Parkinson's disease, this kind of affects three major domains. So one is what we call executive function. And so that's people's ability to do multitasking, to do complex planning, to react fast. 
um, language. And so this usually manifests that people have a lot more problems finding the right word. They're not as fluent as they used to be. And then memory, which is really more pulling back the uh, memories as opposed to getting them in. Dementia means that you have problems with your thinking and memory that are so severe that you can no longer take care of yourself. So symptoms of dementia may be that you're driving and you get lost frequently, including going to common places, that you can't remember where your car is on a regular basis, um, that you're paying the same bill twice or you're not paying the bill at all. And so these are things that really impact day-to-day -day function. And so for a lot of people, it's kind of reassuring to know that they don't have dementia. Um, it's important to know that to really make this distinction, you need to get tested. And you may even have to ask your physician that you want a five or a 10 minute test to go through your thinking and memory so that you can get an objective measure of how your thinking and memory is doing. Uh, because a lot of times people are inaccurate, that people with dementia say they don't have any problem with their memory and that people without dementia are very worried about it because they have some of these normal age related changes. Um, it's important, so dementia, outside of having a cure for Parkinson's, which would be great, I think the next most important research goal would be to try to get a treatment for dementia. Uh, currently, dementia is the leading reason why people with Parkinson's disease need to go to nursing homes. It's a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in Parkinson's disease, and it affects all aspects of people's day-to-day -day function. It's a big reason why a lot of people with Parkinson's who are lawyers, engineers, physicians end up having to go on disability is because of the thinking and memory problems. Um, and it's also important to know that it may be treatable or reversible. And so when we talk about thinking and memory problems, Parkinson's is one cause, uh, but medications are a potential cause. And I've had patients who are on sleep medications that have caused syndromes that look like dementia. People with sleep disorders, people with chronic pain, people with bad depression can all look like they have dementia, but it's reversible. And so it's really important to make sure that we rule out other potential causes for dementia before we assume that it's all related to Parkinson's disease. Um, this is an important slide, and I'll get back to this idea time and time again throughout um, our talk. Um, it's not so important that you can see the details, but the idea behind it is important. And this is an idea that Parkinson's disease is a process that probably began 10 to 20 years before you had any motor symptoms. And there's an increasing amount of evidence that alpha-synuclein, which is the protein that causes Parkinson's, that's toxic to neurons, is first seen actually in the nerves in the gut, so in the intestines and the esophagus and the salivary glands. And then over years, it goes up the brainstem and it causes what are called premotor symptoms. So people can have loss of sense of smell, they can have change in mood and personality, change in thinking. Uh, change in sleep habits that precede their motor symptoms and tremor by years. Um, when it reaches kind of the mid-stage, which is where it involves the midbrain, where dopamine is produced, that's kind of the classic Parkinson's phase, but then it can continue to progress and involve other parts of the brain, including those parts of the brain important for thinking and memory and cause dementia. So our, our conception of Parkinson's disease has really expanded a lot, and this in, in, is important for non-motor symptoms because the motor symptoms are kind of explained well by our classical view of looking at Parkinson's as just a disease of dopamine, but the non-motor symptoms have to do with every other part of the brain and even other parts of the body like the gut and the eye. So in addition to affecting dopamine, Parkinson's affects a lot of other neurotransmitters, one of which is called acetylcholine, and that's one of the uh, neurotransmitters that we target with medications to try to help people with thinking and memory. Um, as I said, it doesn't just affect the basal ganglia, it also affects the frontal lobes, which are important for thinking and memory. And we're now learning that the basal ganglia, which is the part of the brain that we use for deep brain stimulation and we think is so central to Parkinson's, doesn't just control movement, it's also important for controlling thinking and memory, for pain, um, for emotional regulation. So Parkinson's is really uh, a much broader disorder than we usually think about it. Um, I like this slide and I use this analogy a lot that the brain is like a muscle. The brain's obviously not a muscle, but it's like a muscle, and the main idea is, is that if you don't use it, you can lose it. And so the things that are important with this is one, is that if you have any concerns or worries to get your memory tested and make sure there's not another cause, and then exercise is important, and Lee did a great job talking about physical exercise, and so there's a great deal of evidence that particularly aerobic exercise increases nerve growth factors, increases stem cells in the brain, and is probably the single most important thing you can do to try to prevent dementia. Um, mental exercise is also important, 
And just like Lee was saying, it doesn't really matter. There's no evidence that crossword puzzles or Sudoku or luminosity, no, nothing is better than anything else, but what is better is that you do something that you really enjoy. Um, none of these activities is magical, but doing something is important. And then social activity. Um, and I actually learned about this from a Davis Finney event that I went to before, that people with poor social capital, so as people have Parkinson's, they lose the people they work with, they're not playing softball anymore, and pretty soon their social network is just their caregiver, that people with really restricted social networks have the same risk of death as if they had started smoking. Um, so it really emphasizes how important it is that people really stay socially active and socially engaged. Um, by being strategic, I mean, and this goes back to this idea that uh, people with Parkinson's have problems with pulling back memories, not getting them in. So people can use smartphones, people can use lists, you can use other strategies to help get around some of the memory problems. And then there are medications uh, like a medicine Dinepazil or Aricep, there's Exelon Patch, there's several options of medications that can also help people with thinking and memory problems in Parkinson's. None of them are perfect, so we really need a lot more research in this area. Sleep and energy um, is another uh, big topic, and I think there's a session on that this afternoon. So the symptoms of sleep disorders um, are, are variable. So Parkinson's disease itself can affect sleep, and that can cause insomnia, which means problems going to sleep, or problems with sleep maintenance, where people are able to go to sleep okay, but they wake up during the middle of the night. Um, it can cause something called restless leg syndrome, where people feel kind of an achy, uncomfortable sensation in their legs that gets better when they get up and walk around. Uh, REM behavior disorder, or rapid eye movement behavior disorder, this is acting out dreams. And this is actually one of the symptoms that can oftentimes precede Parkinson's by several years. And sleep apnea um, oftentimes manifests as people have problems with snoring or that they will stop breathing intermittently during the night. All of these things are more common in Parkinson's disease. Exci excessive daytime sleepiness means that people are tired during the day, and a lot of times people with sleep disorders think they get a good night's sleep, but they don't get good quality sleep because they're moving around so much, and the main symptom they experience is that they feel tired during the day, they can't sit at a lecture, for instance, or they can't watch a TV program without nodding off. And then fatigue is separate from sleepiness. So fatigue, I kind of use the analogy of when people have the flu, you can take a nap, wake up from your nap, and you don't need to take another nap, but you still don't have energy to do things. Um, and that's the difference between fatigue and sleepiness. And fatigue is also very common in people with Parkinson's. So it's important because sleep affects almost everything, every aspect of our life. And so when people don't get a good night's sleep, particularly with Parkinson's disease, their medications don't seem to work as well, uh, their tremor is worse, their mood is worse, their pain is worse, so it's really important to treat sleep well. Um, Parkinson's disease is a 24-hour disease. Parkinson's doesn't go to sleep just because you go to sleep, and so it's important that people treat their Parkinson's even during the night. And one of the more common reasons why people with Parkinson's have problems with sleep maintenance is that they take their last medication around dinner time and then they wear off in the middle of the night and they get woken up because they're stiff or because they can't turn. Sometimes they don't know why. And when they get a long-acting medication right before bedtime, they actually sleep better and get a better start on the day the next day. Um, it's also important that people don't just take a sleeping pill for sleep problems, but you find out specifically what's wrong. So if people have sleep apnea, for instance, you can have oxygen at night, you can have a CPAP machine, and that's really gonna improve your sleep quality so you feel rested the next day, whereas if you take a sleeping pill, you're not gonna get the high sleep quality you need and you're still gonna feel tired the next day. Again, it happens because Parkinson's doesn't just affect dopamine, it also affects melatonin, which is the neurotransmitter that's most important for setting our sleep-wake cycles and sleep. Um, it also affects parts of the brainstem that are important for that, and norepinephrine is one of the neurotransmitters. It's adrenaline that's really important for energy and may be related to why people with Parkinson's have more fatigue. Um, so things that people can do about it. Um, one, when people have a, a sleep mate or a, a caregiver and they sleep in the same bed, I oftentimes will ask the caregiver what, what's happening at night because the patient doesn't know. Um, if people are sleeping in different beds or different rooms, that's oftentimes a clue that things are not going very well. So for instance, people with RM behavior disorder frequently will have dreams where they're fighting crime and their care partner is getting beat up at night. Um, and, and when those kinds of things happen, there's, it's actually a pretty easy to treat disorder, uh, but again, you have to take a history to recognize it. And if I don't know what's going on, I'll have people go to a sleep lab to make sure that we get the right diagnosis before we start any kind of treatment. 
Exercise, exercise, exercise. We're going to talk about that with everything, but take exercise during the day can help sleep. Um, there's a couple patterns. Sometimes people feel that if they do exercise first thing in the morning, it really helps them throughout their day. Other people feel that exercise last thing in the evening helps them wind down. Whatever your pattern is, uh, it doesn't really matter as long as you find a habit that you're comfortable with and that you can stick with. And then there are specific treatments, like I said, there's specific treatments for sleep apnea. Clonazepam and melatonin can help with REM behavior disorder. Dopamine agonist medications can help with restless leg syndrome. So there are specific treatments that can help people with their sleep. Um, for fatigue, it uh, can be a very challenging symptom to treat. Uh, some of the things that can be helpful are graded exercise and particularly strength training seems to be very helpful for people with fatigue, but you want to do it gradually. You don't want to go and work out for three hours and then not be able to do anything for the next three days and then give up on exercise. You want to start with a gradual level that you can do and kind of build up progressively. Sometimes stimulant medications like Ritalin can also be helpful for people with a lot of fatigue. And we actually just finished a study at the University of Colorado that acupuncture uh, can be helpful with some people with their fatigue. Um, so turning to mood, I really like this slide um, because mood changes your world. Um, it, it's not something where you just, it's like you have depression, you are depression. And, and depression changes everything. One of the clues I sometimes get when I talk to patients is that when objectively they seem to be doing well, but subjectively they're not doing very well, sometimes the difference is depression because they see things as going so badly. Um, so depression is very common in Parkinson's disease. Um, and one of the things that's really important to note is that people with Parkinson's disease compared to people with rheumatoid arthritis or other diseases that have the same level of disability have twice the rates of depression. Um, and I, I, make, I make that point because Parkinson's is not just that people are feeling sad because they have Parkinson's, it's actually because of the way Parkinson's affects the brain. Um, anxiety is also very common. All these things affect about a third or more of people with Parkinson's and it can take normal flavors uh, people can have what's called generalized anxiety disorder, where they feel kind of worried or nervous all the time. People can have social phobia, where they don't want to interact with people. And a lot of times, people will blame their social phobia on their tremor. They just don't want to be around people anymore. Uh, but a lot of times, it's an anxiety disorder. And if you treat it, they can get back in touch with people. And as I talked about earlier, it's so important that people maintain their social connections. And so it's really important to recognize that. Apathy. Um, has kind of two things to it. One is that people have a flattening of affect. They don't feel sad, they don't feel happy, and they have a lot of reduced motivation. It's one of the things that really drives caregivers nuts, the apathy, and it doesn't seem to bother patients that much. Um, and we'll talk about ways that we can manage that. So it's important because mood affects everything. It affects your ability to exercise. And it's important to know that, I, that people really deserve help for these things. I know there's a lot of shame and stigma, particularly around depression. Um, but when I talk to people about it, if you have tremor, it's because of low dopamine. We replace your dopamine, your tremor is better. Same thing with depression. Um, actually, uh, John, who's a motivational speaker, gave a great talk yesterday about how he was dealing with depression. And part of how you deal with it is not to kind of try to stuff it down, but it's to talk about it and it's to get treatment. And if you replace the serotonin, people with Parkinson's actually oftentimes do better with treatment for depression than people without Parkinson's because it is due to this very specific neurochemical change. Um, and it happens because Parkinson's disease affects serotonin, uh, which is one of the uh, neurotransmitters that's very important for mood. And the basal ganglia is also important for regulating mood. Part of how we know that is that when people place deep brain stimulators and it gets in the wrong place, uh, people's mood can change pretty drastically. And it's actually one of the risk factors after DBS is that people can have depression or even suicide if, if the deep brain stimulator is not programmed the right way. So things that can be done about it, um, the first step is to talk to people about it, to talk to your caregiver, talk to your friends, talk to your family. Um, for people who are open to it, working with a counselor or a psychologist can be helpful. For people who don't like medications, uh, working with a, a therapist is just as effective as taking medications. And so that's a very fair first step. Other people don't want to talk about it and would rather take medications. Both are fine. Exercise is important and it helps with mood. Um, for apathy, one of the things that's important to know is that it's a difficult symptom to treat. In terms of how the brain works, have people seen the movie Awakenings? Have people seen that movie? A great movie with Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. But anyway, there's a scene in the movie where Robert De Niro, who has uh, Parkinson's, cannot move, 
And when they throw a ball at him, he's able to catch it. And that's because there's two parts of the brain that control people's behavior. One is for internally generated actions, so doing something because I want to, and there's another part for externally generated actions, which is responding to the outside world. And so we use that trick with motor symptoms that, for instance, if someone is frozen, they can march to a metronome, they can step over a line. Same thing with apathy. People may not be able to make a schedule for themselves for the day, but a lot of times they can follow a routine, and that can be very helpful in terms of people's ability to make it through and manage the day. So the autonomic nervous system is kind of the automatic part of our nervous system, and it takes care of all kinds of functions like breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, and it's affected very early on in Parkinson's disease. Um, constipation, even as far back as high school, is associated with the risk of Parkinson's, and it may have to do with the fact that Parkinson's involves the gut and the nerves in the gut before it affects the brain. Um, it affects the bladder. Um, blood pressure is affected in people with Parkinson's disease, and sometimes this shows up in an obvious way that people feel lightheaded. Sometimes it shows up in not so obvious ways. So people with low blood pressure may complain of fatigue. They may complain of headaches. They may complain of problems with their thinking and memory. Low blood pressure is one of the reasons why a lot of people with Parkinson's get worse during the summer is because they're dehydrated and their blood pressure drops. So it's really important that people keep track of their blood pressure and get your blood pressure checked both lying down and standing up because that change in blood pressure causes a lot of these symptoms. A lot of times people with a lifetime of high blood pressure can get off their blood pressure medications because Parkinson's will naturally lower blood pressure. So th these symptoms are important because they range from things that are annoying, um, and which would include things like sweating, to things that are life-threatening, which could include blood pressure. Uh, people can have uh, actually life-threatening constipation where you have bowel impactions. And it also can affect quality of life in a number of ways. For instance, sexual dysfunction can affect people's connection with their life partner. Um, so these things are really important uh, to talk about, and, and they're treatable. Um, so again, it, it affects Parkinson's in numerous ways outside of the brain. And things that are important to do about it, tracking your blood pressure. Um, for a lot of people with constipation, just like exercise you have to take care of every day, you have to take care of your bowels every day and get on a good regimen. And that usually includes having a lot of fluids, fibers, and exercise. And then there's other things that we could add to that, like a stool softener, like a medication like Miralax to get people on a regular schedule. Um, there's medications that I'm not going to talk about, but I, I will this afternoon, that talk about drooling, uh, mucus, uh, bladder dysfunction. There are medications available that can treat these symptoms. There are also non-medical things that people can do, like sugarless gum or sucking candies that can help with drooling. And sexual dysfunction, I'll again talk about just briefly right now, but there are a lot of reasons that that can occur. Um, some of it has to do with the effects of Parkinson's on the genitals. Some of it has to do with secondary things, that people with Parkinson's are stiffer, and so they can't move their hips as well, and so there may need to be changes in, in stimulation. And then there's changes in intimacy, that if somebody is acting as a caregiver, they may not feel sexy anymore. They may feel more like a nurse um, than a dominatrix, for instance. And, and that things may change in the bedroom, and so sometimes couples counseling or sexual counseling uh, can be helpful. Um, visual symptoms or things that come up, and I don't know if this is inducing any visual hallucinations in people. I haven't seen it on a large screen before. Uh, but the symptoms that people have with the visual system include problems with reading, uh, problems with night vision and driving, uh, visual illusions, and what illusions are is, for instance, seeing maybe a bug in the carpet, seeing a pattern in the rug, seeing something out of the corner of your eye, and then when you go to look at it, it goes away. That's a visual illusion. A visual hallucination is saying uh, there's a man right there, there's a dog over there, and I could stare right at them and they don't go away. And sometimes people have hallucinations where they have insight, they know it's a hallucination. Sometimes people can have hallucinations where they don't know it's, it's not there. Um, it's important for a number of reasons. One is that visual problems affect your safety, and visual problems are one of the number one reasons that people with Parkinson's can have problems with driving safety. And I'll just put this out there, is that if people have any concerns about their driving, it's important to go get tested, to go do an on-the-road driving test to make sure that you don't have an accident and hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. That's really the bottom line. And so what I tell my patients is that if they have concerns, either stop driving or get tested. Um, that's both for the safety of others and also for legal reasons, that just because you have Parkinson's disease, another person's lawyer can go after you. Um, so it's really important to make sure that you get tested if you have concerns about that. 
Um, these can be side effects of medications, particularly hallucinations can be side effects of too much dopamine, and so it may be a sign that you need to reduce dopamine, and, and they're manageable. So it happens because Parkinson's disease affects the, mo the muscles that control eye movements. Um, so particularly problems with reading, people have to bring their eyes in, what we call convergence, and that can be hard for people with Parkinson's and can be treated with prisms. There are dopamine neurons in the retina, and that has to do with people's ability not to see visual acuity, which is black letters on a white background, but what's called contrast sensitivity, which are dark gray light letters on a lighter gray background. And that's what's really important for driving and night safety. And Parkinson's and dopamine affect the visual system, and particularly dopamine agonist medications can cause visual hallucinations and these kind of more scary uh, hallucinations that are worth treating. So things that can be done about it is that there's ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, what are called neuro-optometrists, who can make glasses that have prisms that can help with reading. Um, as I talked about, driving testing is important, and medication adjustments can be helpful for bothersome hallucinations. Um, other important stuff, and, and I, I like this slide, it fits into the theme today. So it says, what fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day. <laughs> and again, just trying to hammer home how important exercise. Every single symptom on these non-motor symptom lists, every motor symptom is benefited by exercise. Um, so that's going to be a theme that comes up again and again today. So it's really important. But other things that are important uh, is pain. And I don't know why it is, but there seems to be some kind of myth out there that Parkinson's is not a painful condition. But about 75% of people with Parkinson's have pain as part of their Parkinson's, oftentimes neck pain, shoulder pain, pain in their foot. And it's important to recognize, I see people who get unnecessary surgery on their neck and their shoulder because of pain related to Parkinson's. The other thing is that pain can be a sign that something needs to be done. Um, so pain in the shoulder is sometimes a sign that the tendons in the shoulder are shortening because you're not using your shoulder fully and you're not stretching it out. And so um, we're kind of moving from this idea of rehab or rehabilitation to prehab or prehabilitation. So we really want to try to do these things like stretching, like balance work before you have a problem, not after. Osteoporosis means thinning of the bones and puts people at higher risk for fractures. That's more common in people with Parkinson's. As Claire mentioned, vitamin D and calcium are really important for people with Parkinson's to take. Melanoma is a type of skin cancer. And again, this is part of the reason why we think Parkinson's involves the whole body. So Parkinson's affects the skin. It used to be thought that melanoma may be from the Parkinson's medications, but we now know that it has nothing to do with medications, that it's just part of Parkinson's, so it's really important that people with Parkinson's get their skin checked by a dermatologist at least every couple years. Impulse control disorders, these are things like internet pornography, um, shopping, uh, use of prostitutes. These con impulse control disorders, gambling, uh, come up potentially as a result of some of the medications that we use, particularly dopamine agonists um, and sometimes Cinemat. And the reason that they're important to know about is that these are things that most people don't think about when they think about side effects of medications. And so it's important that people can recognize this early before they lose their wife and house, as opposed to taking them off the medication afterwards. And the wife and house usually don't come back just because the medications are gone. Um, so, so it's important, pain affects everything, it affects sleep, it affects mood, it's important to treat. Um, hip fractures are actually one of the causes of death in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, so it's really important to try to prevent that, also to prevent melanoma, which is a treatable form of skin cancer early on. And like I said before, medications can cost you your house and your marriage, and so it's important to get those things, uh, know about them before it becomes a problem. Um, Parkinson's affects pain processing, um, and we talked about how dopamine medications can affect motivational centers in the brain. Um, so things that you can do about it is to get your bones checked with your primary care doctor, taking vitamin D and calcium, exercise, particularly weight-bearing exercise like walking or lifting weights helps with bone strength, getting your skin checked, and then talking to your doctor about these issues. Um, so the action items uh, from this talk, so one is to recognize, and, and I know there was a lot of things that we went through today, um, to recognize these common non-motor symptoms and to speak to your physicians about them if they're affecting your quality of life. And a lot of times, unfortunately, the onus is on you to bring them up that your doctor may not ask you about them. 
Um, second is that physical exercise is important for almost all of these, including mood, memory, energy, sleep, and constipation. Um, so, so really make sure you exercise. Find ways to stay mentally active and socially active that you enjoy. And I think actually finding things that you enjoy that bring you laughter are also important in terms of just, one, just living well with Parkinson's disease, but I think, I suspect that it actually helps slow down the progression of the illness. Um, staying well hydrated is critical, particularly during the summer, and it helps with blood pressure and constipation. And if you're experiencing anxiety or depression, it's really important that you reach out to other people for help and don't just keep it bottled up inside. Thanks for your attention.